Welcome back to Calgary Barbell HQ for the third and final installment of the definitive guide to bench series. In video one of this series, we went over all the equipment that you may or may not want to use for bench, as well as the racks and benches and options in that regard. In our most recent video, we talked about the entirety of the setup before unracking the bar and all of the nuance to grip width, foot placement, and all that good stuff. Today, however, we're going to get into everything from the unrack to the re-rack and all the technical cueing and, and technique that I've used to build my bench up and in my coaching of clients for the past 10 years. That being said, let's get started with the unwrap. Benching properly really begins with getting the bar out of the rack and into position properly. I think that anyone who's ever unracked a bench that feels light in the hands and had that, oh, I'm gonna crush it kind of feeling, knows how much of an impact the unrack can make. So the first cue I'm gonna give with the unrack is to unrack with the triceps. I know that sounds a little weird, so let me explain it. We wanna try and maintain as much of the tightness and position from the setup as we can when we unrack the bar. We want the elbows to extend and we don't want the shoulder blades to protract or elevate through the unrack. If we lose that position on the unrack, then we're undoing all of that work that went into the setup, meaning that we'll drop the chest back down, increasing the range of motion, and usually end up with a less strong bottom position. Another important aspect of the bench, and this is gonna come before we unrack the bar, is to ensure that we're taking our breath. Now, unlike the squat and the deadlift where we're trying to clamp our ribs down on top of our abs and kind of create this unified block of tension out of the torso, in the bench, we're almost trying to do the exact opposite. We're trying to reach the rib cage up as much as possible and then fill ourselves with air to increase the size and increase how big we can get up towards the bar. I recommend taking this breath before we unrack and before the weight of the bar is bearing down on us because that's gonna allow us to get bigger and stay bigger via air pressure once we get the bar out. If we try to take a breath after we've unracked and the weight of the bar is already pushing down, we're not gonna get as big, we're not gonna get as much air. So my general recommendation is to take your breath before you unrack and then breathe again after you re-rack. Now, obviously, I don't want you to hold your breath until you pass out or anything like that. If you're doing a set of 10, you know, breathe after five reps at lockout. Try to regain your position, take your breath again, and then proceed to finish the rest of the set. On higher rep sets, it's also okay to breathe between reps. Just try to make sure that you're holding air pressure in while actually performing the movement and breathe between the reps if at all possible. Once we get the bar lifted off the J-cups, the next part of the process is to get the bar into position. My favorite cue for getting the bar set correctly is to pull the bar out as if you're doing a straight arm pull down on a cable machine. When we do this properly, we get a bit more shoulder blade depression and the chest comes up a tiny bit more, which ensures that the bar is starting in a strong position where we've got good leverage. This cue should help us to re-tighten, regaining any lost position from the unrack if we lost any at all. Once we've got the bar unracked and in the right position, then we begin the descent. As we bring the bar down to the chest, most lifters will wanna start thinking about tucking the elbows, albeit to varying degrees. On the descent of the lift, most people's optimal bar path will be to a slightly lower point on their chest or upper abs. Throughout the bench press, I think that when we're talking about cueing, it's very important to have some independence between the cueing of the shoulder blades versus the elbow. A lot of novice lifters will think about the external rotation that's necessary to create a good bench position in the setup and will think that that should extend into the rest of the lift, causing those lifters to greatly over tuck their elbows. What we actually want is to have that tightness and tension of the external rotation, but without the elbows continuing to follow through with the movement of the shoulders. Understanding and practicing this concept will allow us to keep our shoulder blades locked in place while the elbows tuck slightly on the descent and flare slightly on the ascent. Another major point in the descent of the bench is to try to reach your chest up to the bar. As the bar descends, we want very much to maintain as high a chest position as possible. I'll often use the cue stay big as the lifter descends so that the shoulders don't start to elevate as the bar reaches the chest. We wanna to try to pull the shoulder blades back and reach the chest and ribs upwards towards the bar as it descends in order to maintain position. 
Once the bar has descended, we get into the next part, which is the touch. For lifters who aren't looking to compete, you don't necessarily need to pause your bench presses, but learning to pause and practicing it will help you build your bench a great deal. And I think a paused bench is probably one of the single best accessory movements, especially for those who exclusively train touch and go in the gym. For powerlifting competitors, we have to touch the bar to the chest until motionless. Then once we receive the press command from the head referee, we can press the bar back up. Where the bar touches on the lifter's chest is gonna depend greatly on the lifter's chosen grip width, as well as the length of the upper limb of their arm. Closer grips will touch lower, and wider grips will generally touch a little higher. Lifters with longer arms will also often touch lower, where lifters with shorter arms will touch a little bit higher. Most lifters are going to be looking to touch the bar somewhere between the nipple line and the bottom of the center of the rib cage, or the xiphoid process, if you want to be really fancy about it. One of the major considerations when I'm coaching a lifter's touch point is to watch how their forearms line up onto the bar and how the elbows are positioned during the lift. I like to check this both from a straight on side angle and looking straight on from the side of the lifter's feet. From the side angle, if we notice the elbows are too far in front of the bar, we might benefit from lowering the touch point and vice versa for a higher touch point if the elbows are behind the bar. From the feet angle, if we notice the elbows are wanting to come in too far beyond the grip and over tuck, the lifter may be more comfortable with a narrower grip or simply being cued to flare their elbows a bit more. Whereas if the elbows are flared out beyond the grip, we may want to explore how a wider grip feels, but potentially could also get away with just cueing some elbow tucking or maintenance of that tuck. The key with a touch point in any case is consistency. When I was newer to lifting and working on trying to get the consistency of my touch point, I would sometimes chalk the center of the bar and I would do this lightly, don't ruin a block of chalk for this. So I could see exactly where the bar touched each and every rep with the goal being a single chalk mark at the end of the set. Another major component of the touch is the weight of the touch. And what I mean by this is how hard or lightly you touch the bar to your chest. A good way to think about it is in terms of the percentage of the bar's weight that is in your hands versus on your chest. I personally would say I'm around 80-20 or even 90-10 in my bench press with keeping 80-90% to 90 of the bar weight in my hands and 10-20% to 20 unloading on my chest in the bottom position. Touch weight will also have a fair bit to do with your leg drive style, which we covered a lot of in the last video. But for those lifters using more sinking and a heavier touch, the jolt style of leg drive is usually preferred, where lifters with a lighter touch and more weight in the hands will often use a more consistent leg drive style. If you're unsure on that terminology, make sure to check out part two of our definitive guide to bench. A final note for anyone looking to compete in the bench press in the IPF specifically, as of January 2023, there's been a new rule introduced that dictates bench depth as a requirement for pass lift. Now bench depth, the way that it's explained and the way that it is in practice might be a little bit confusing. So here's a quick primer. Bench depth in the rule book, the IPF technical rules is defined as both elbow joints traveling parallel to or below the top of both respective shoulder joints. What we're looking at when referees are judging the top of the shoulder joint is actually gonna be the top of the shoulder joint if the lifter were standing. So we're looking at basically the center of the shoulder joint when the lifter is lying down. And the tip of the elbow is going to be obviously the bottom or the underside of the elbow. So as long as the underside of your elbow is parallel to or below the center of your shoulder joint when you're lying down and the head referee is looking straight on at you, then you are fulfilling the requirement of bench depth. Now, obviously, if you film your lift and you don't fulfill this requirement, you may need to narrow your bench grip. You may need to touch heavier so that the bar goes lower and your elbows go lower. There are probably a, a couple different ways to tackle this, but just be aware that that rule exists and hopefully we've given an adequate definition of it here. At this point, you've either received the press command from the referee, paused for the appropriate length, or just touched your chest and decided, hey, I should push this back up. In any case, let's talk through the cues and the process involved with initiating and following through the actual press itself. As I've said, we'll see many different styles of touch and it logically follows that we'll see many different styles of press. 
In the case of the soft touch, we're looking to hold the majority of the weight of the bar in the hands and maintain a great deal of tension in the upper back and shoulders while we initiate the press. One cue I use is to start the press with your lats. Now, before anybody starts furiously typing in the comments about muscle and joint actions, obviously I know and you know that this isn't actually what we're doing. This cue is simply a way to have the lifter prioritize tightness, stability, and position in the upper back and shoulder blades, and to ensure that those are established and maintained as the first step of the press. Losing this position as the press starts is one of the most common issues I see with more beginner lifters. As we press, the shoulders will, will elevate and protract, and this may be fine on a heavy single or max attempt, depending on how much position we lose, but on anything more than one rep, we're likely gonna feel the effects of losing this position. If you're a lifter whose reps go from very easy to incredibly difficult in the span of just a few reps, this specific issue could be the culprit. For lifters who touch harder and allow more of the weight to rest on and sink into the chest, I do still recommend that there be a focus on maintaining the shoulder blade and upper back position with a harder touch on the chest. Losing too much shoulder position during the pause can still cause misgrooved reps. Lifters that touch harder should work to be able to maintain their back tension even while they allow some of the tension in the pressing muscles to dissipate during a pause. When these lifters initiate the press, they want to ensure that as leg drive helps the bar get started, the shoulder blades resume their advantaged position in some amount of retraction and depression. In regards to the bar path, we want to see what's called a J curve. And if we watch the end cap of the bar from the side, it'll look like a J. This means that the bar is going to move backwards over the lifter's face or shoulders, sort of immediately off the chest, at least to some degree, and then straighten out upwards, finally locking out somewhere near where they started the rep. This J curve can be more or less exaggerated lifter to lifter. Maybe the best way to describe why we want the bar to come backwards a bit is because of what happens when the bar goes forwards. When a lifter presses away from the shoulders and towards the feet, we'll see a misgroove and a pretty pronounced sticking point. Sometimes lifters can correct and salvage the lift, but this specific kind of misgroove accounts for a lot of botched reps. When we're lowering the bar, we don't touch perfectly in line with the shoulders. That would be incredibly demanding in terms of shoulder flexibility and simply not possible for most people. We use a lower touch because that better suits the movement of the shoulder girdle. And when we press, we want to undo that horizontal movement in an attempt to get the bar back over the shoulder joint to increase our leverage against the bar. And this takes us to the lockout. The finishing touch of the bench press. When we lock the bar out, we're striving to maintain position in the shoulder blades. You'll notice a theme there if we're going for another rep. This is, again, where we'll see some lifters lose a fair bit of position, and this can have consequences if performing more than a single. When we lock out, my favorite cue is to lock out with just the triceps. If we can finish with the elbows and not let the shoulders follow through, then we maintain shoulder position for the next rep. Another way to think about it is to lock out as short as possible. Although I think that sometimes causes lifters to not completely straighten their arms, potentially resulting in some red lights if you're on the platform. One final consideration for those choosing to compete in powerlifting is that you will have a rack command from the head referee. So in your training, don't get into the habit of pressing it straight into the rack. I've unfortunately seen that habit manifest on the platform numerous times, and it costs people PRs. If you're a competitor, always extend the elbow joint as much as possible at the start and the end of the bench, and practice holding your lockout for a solid one to two count before the start command and at the end of every set. And there you have it, folks, the finale of the definitive guide to the bench press. We really hope you enjoyed this three-part series. And if you learned something, consider taking a look over at calgarybarbell.programs.app where we offer our app coaching service. You get a program library of nearly 50 programs, access to any new programs that I make available there, as well as weekly form checks from our coaching staff in our private Discord. Consider leaving a like or subscribing if you enjoyed the video, and let us know in the comments section below if you want clarification on anything, or if you think we missed something. Till next time, peace.